kind of went over there not anticipating that, you know, really kind of thought, why exactly are we coming over here? It's not that I didn't want to come. I just thought, is there not somewhere else we could be better used? And sure enough, you know, like I said, like Kaz said, there, there's, there was still plenty of war to be had. And um, so we got over there and was part of that front end of the up armor being shipped over there while I was over there. So you started seeing some trucks with it, some without it. You know, we'd be cruising through town, headed back to the fob. And I mean, guys would just get down in the truck. There, there weren't a lot of gunners just sitting up on guns. We would just kind of duck our head down <laughs> behind the blast plates because you never knew when you were just going to get hit. And, uh, you know, so, uh, we, we did quite a bit of ops while I was over there in Iraq. And, uh, you know, actually I was actually in a truck that ran over a double stack mine and blew the entire back end of my truck out. And, uh, l- lucky I'm even here. The fact that I've got all my fingers and toes and limbs is kind of a miracle. Welcome to Winning Strategies Playbook. The podcast where we welcome business leaders, CEOs, and industry experts to discuss the rise to the top, building wealth, and real estate insights. Here's your host, Jeremy Spann. Welcome to Winning Strategies Playbook. For more information on this show, you can go to our website, myexperiencedrealtor.com. That's experience with an ED. So for my fellow Marines, like I got here today, you know, need a little help with that spelling, put an ED on that experienced. That way you can get to the site. When you get there, you can always click on find a trusted professional and we will make sure that you get engaged with somebody to help you buy and sell real estate anywhere on the planet. But more importantly, you want to click on that podcast button. And when you click on that podcast button, you're going to scroll right on down to Nick Wright, fellow Marine, entrepreneur. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me, man. How are you doing today? Doing good, man. Doing good. So for the audience is not only are Nick and I fellow Marines, we share some fellow Marines in common. And actually, even though Nick and I did not serve in the same unit at the same time, we have a mutual friend, Eric Kazmaier, who's been on this show where we have had some overlap with, right? Yeah. And so that's how Nick and I got connected. And we're going to dive more into that as we get going on the show. But Nick, my father-in-law said when I started the show over a year ago that I have to do a joke. So I intentionally do bad jokes. (laughs) But you being a physical fitness god, I thought this one would be appropriate. Why do couples go to the gym? Mm, I don't know. They want their relationship to work out. I think it's the only time I've gotten a laugh out of any of my horrible jokes. <laughs> well, I'm not right in the head. So, <laughs> like time, so. <laughs> so let's let's uh, talk about uh, let's go back in time and kind of walk through the journey to get to where you are now, and you know, and the things that have helped you. Because look, when you're a successful entrepreneur like yourself, you got there because it was easy, right? Not at all. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, no road rash. I mean, somebody yeah. handed you a guide and said, hey, this is how you go be successful, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wish. Right. It would have been that way. There is no easy button in that category. No, no. Of course, you and I don't know anything about easy buttons, I think, on anything related. No, no, not, not at all. Well, no. except for now. You are my easy button in business. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> There's still a hard button in there somewhere. There's somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so... Where where are you from? Where'd you grow up? And take us to why going into the Marine Corps and when that happened and so forth. So, you know, I have uh, an interesting story. Um, you know, I, I grew up here, uh, right here, uh, just outside of Fort Worth, uh, Richland Hills. Uh, graduated from Richland High School. Um, military was something I kind of thought as a kid I would always do. You know, I grew up watching the Rambo movies just like everybody else did. So, um, but as I got into high school, you know, I thought being in high school was about having fun. And uh, I didn't actually graduate on time. Um, I kind of drifted a little bit. Uh, It was a little bit of a, uh, I wouldn't say a troubled kid. I just had a had an idea that I thought that phase of my life was about having fun. 
actually had dropped out of high school, believe it or not, my senior year and um, just did not have a very good direction. I was not thinking direction. I was just like your typical kid that was just living in the day, what I wanted to do. One thing led to another. Um, I just found myself um, not necessarily in the best of spots. Uh, I am the reason my mom and dad started going to church. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, you know, again, um, I didn't really recognize it at the time. I really thought everybody else had the problem, not me. And uh, uh, long story short, um, my mom and dad, I have really good parents. Um, they, they really poured a lot into, to me and my sister, um, and kind of chased me down, you know, uh, pleading with me, working with me, being patient with me. And, uh, one thing led to another, you know, I know not everybody's religious, but, uh, you know, I, I, I am a man of faith, whatever that means to everybody else. Uh, you know, I'm a believer. Um, and that is kind of where my life turned around a little bit. Now, you know, I don't have one of these stories where, you know, I say, well, I got saved and just everything was roses and I straightened up. That, that's not really the case. I just, uh, I got saved and, and my life just kind of changed in a better direction is what I would say. Um, I found myself wanting to go back to school. I wanted to graduate uh, because I wanted to go into the Marine Corps. Uh, why the Marine Corps? I just... At that age, you're like, well, I want to do the hardest thing. And which one is it? Well, it's Marine Corps, you know. Um, and so I had to go back to the school and pretty much beg them to let me back in. They were like, no, not a snowball's chance. You're not coming back here. And uh, it took me several um, attempts to convince the school to allow me to come back to graduate because I wanted to make something of myself. And uh, they let me back in and uh, I graduated with A's and B's, make a long story short. Some of the teachers that severely disliked me uh, because my past character uh, ended up crying uh, when I left school for the last time I graduated and ended up coming to a few years later, my wedding. So uh, a huge turnaround at a young stage in my life. Uh, but I did, I told my recruiter, I said, I, I need to be out of here moments after I graduate. Like I'm trying to, to go in a better direction, but I don't need to tarry around here very long. And, uh, three days after I walked across the stage of graduation, I was standing on the yellow footprints at San Diego MCRD. It's the best thing for me. Um, you know, uh, and that's kind of how I ended up in the Marine Corps, um, you know, I was I signed up to be infantry. Uh, I wanted to do the the whole thing, you know. And at the time, uh, if I was to say, well, I wanted to serve my country, and I mean that was part of it. But at 19 years old, I just, you know, to be honest, I I wanted to do that for myself. Um, it wasn't really till 9/11 happened did I really have that that feeling of. Oh, okay. This isn't about me. This is, you know, this is really about my country. Like this, this is real. You know, the world is real. And, uh, and I was in second battalion, fifth Marines, uh, was in a cat team, uh, machine gunner at the time. Talk, talk about what a cat team is for the audience. So a cat team is a combined anti armor team. Okay. So in most infantry units, you have what would be what people see in the movies. They just see a rifleman with a pack, you know, more or less. Uh, and then you'll see mortarmen or you'll see a guy carrying a machine gun. And a lot of times what you won't see is you see uh, a heavy weapons company like the heavy machine guns, the 50 caliber guns, um, tow missiles, um, things that anti-tank missiles, uh, javelins, things like that. And I was in a weapons company and uh, I was a machine gunner. So I had to carry the heavy gun around when I was on fire. My deuce. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 50 cal. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I've, I've got many a miles under my feet with that on my on my pack. It's so. still better than carrying a Mark 19, though. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, but, 
but when we're training, um, being able to carry those things is important for a Marine, but the practicality of it and what they're designed to do is to be vehicle mounted. And, um, and really a combined anti-armor team is, you know, we're seeking out the big stuff, the tanks, bunkers, things like that, that are a, a severe nuisance for an infantry platoon moving forward. And, uh, and that's what, what a cat team is. So I was in one of those, uh, my first year and a half, almost two years. Um, I love machine guns. I'm a mechanical guy. It's the trade I'm in now. Um, and I actually volunteered to be a machine gunner. I actually was a, uh, uh, anti-tank assault man. I was a javelin guy and, uh, they needed a spot for a machine gunner and I volunteered for it. And, uh, I just fell in love with machine guns. You know, I spent all my time, spare time, especially when we deployed and I was in Camp Hansen, uh, my first Mew. Um, I spent all my spare time trying to learn about them. You know, everybody was out at the club or running around out in town. And out I'm, in Sinville. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I've been, out there, I've been out there a few times. Uh, Mojo! Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I, I spent most of my time trying to, to be the best machine gunner I could be. I love machine guns and the mechanics of them. I mean, I, I was learning things about them that really weren't necessarily going to make me a better machine gunner. I just was infatuated with them. And... Uh, and I, it, it did me well. Uh, I advanced in rank uh, very quick. That wasn't my goal. But, uh, but I ended up becoming a sergeant in just over two years. Uh, I was a meritorious corporal. I was a meritorious sergeant, Marine of the Quarter. Um, and I was going to say, because really you were an 0351, right? Yes. Yep. And then, which I remember in my day, like you would see six year Lance corporals, and it wasn't because they were bad Marines. It was the cutting score was just it's competitive. There was no, I mean, you would see dudes that were like, especially my era, Gulf War guys, yeah. that you're, you're like, what, what, what'd you get in trouble for? And you're like, nothing. I, I just, their there cutting score was too high. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so you did advance through ranks very quickly as, not only uncommon in itself, but uncommon based on that MOS, right? Y yeah, 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 exactly. And my, you know, there's a there's a two edged sword side of that. Um, you know, with rank comes responsibility, and um, you know, I was a little young for the platoon sergeant, section leader type responsibility because I really hadn't been in the Marine Corps long enough for that side of it. Um, you know, kind of taking a trade, you know, kind of what I do as a mechanic, uh, you learn to fix air conditioners first before you learn to supervise people fixing air conditioners. I was just a good machine gunner. That's all I wanted to be was just a good Marine and a good machine gunner. I had no interest in leading a platoon or being a section leader. I didn't want to do all that. I wanted to mess with the guns. I wanted to shoot the guns, carry the guns and be a gunner. And, uh, but you know, the better you are at your job, people will look to you for many of things, you know, pertaining to that. And uh, I I was always running. I've always been a long distance runner. Um, I've always been into fitness and, and exercise. And, uh, and I, of all the PFTs that I ran, I, I always had a 300. Uh, the couple that I ran that I didn't were like, a 299. Talk about what a 300 PFT is. So in the Marine Corps, uh, when I was in, we have the physical fitness test. Uh, every Marine has to take it, if I remember correctly, like once every six months for their score, like you mentioned, to, to get promoted. If you miss that or you dip it, dodge it, whatever, then you're missing a score and you most likely won't get promoted. Um, but the physical fitness test is three things, um, consist of pull-ups, sit-ups, crunches and a three mile run and you can score a total of a hundred points on each thing uh you know 20 pull-ups five points a piece you get a hundred hundred on the pull-ups uh the crunches were you had to do a hundred of them in i think it was two minutes or less uh, each one's a point so you did a hundred of them you got your hundred there what got a lot of guys was the run uh, the three mile run. So basically three miles, the minute the clock hits 18 minutes, you start getting deducted points from a hundred. Uh, so every minute is six points. Uh, 
if you could run three miles in about 20 minutes or less, you were in the mix. Um, a lot of guys would get all their points on the pull-ups and the sit-ups, and then they would be around that 20-minute to 21-minute mark. Um, and I could I could run three miles in under 17 minutes. It just came natural to me. I ran a lot. I mean, I worked for it, but um, that was just something that came to me a little easier. I was a 17-15 guy. Yeah, so that's so that's, you're getting sub seventeen, man. That's that's cooking. Not sub seventeen. I'm sorry, sub eighteen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I never I never could break the seventeen minute mark. Those are people that are just something freaks. Yeah, they're, they're freaks, freaks, man. I mean, that's fast, right? I mean, yeah. you're you're running at a like all right, math for Marines, whatever that was. It was like I don't know. I'm not going to try to do the math in my head, but I just remember like. Seventeen fifteen was the best, and I could just man, I would just murder myself trying to beat that time. Yes, right, yeah. That's like like you're running like a five forty five to five. Yeah, you're running mm-hmm. like a five minute and forty five yeah, second 545. mile yep, for three right. miles. That is the right math. Yeah, for for most of your even your seasoned runners, that's a that's a pretty gnarly pace. You know, it, once you start getting below that, you're dealing with people that. Not only do they work hard, but they have a gift, mm-hmm. you know, because some people can run all they they're, want. They're genetically designed at that point to go run yes. like the wind. Right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, so I was fortunate in that aspect um, and a fairly strong guy for my size. You know, everyone thinks high of their self, but my goal was always to make sure I was trying to be the best I could be. And uh, for one, it just, you know, did you well with your command? It kept you out of trouble. Um, and two, uh, you know, that's what I went in to do. You know, I, I didn't go in to hang out and all in, in things like that. So, uh, but yeah, that's kind of where I started in the Marine Corps. So, so you're out there at Camp Hanson, you're on your Mew, you get back to CONUS. Yeah. What happens then? CONUS being continental United States, that's the East coast to the West coast, everything outside that main piece of dirt. You're not in Conus anymore. So right. it, it, technical term, I guess. Right? Not not yeah. in Disneyland. No not more. in Disneyland anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had originally wanted to be a recon marine. Uh, again, nineteen going in. Everybody wants to be the best. Everybody wants to be a recon guy or a seal or a ranger or a beret. And um, you know, when I went into the Marine Corps, I was like, well, what's what's the Marine Corps Special Forces? And it's like, well, it's recon. And uh, so I'm like, well, that, I'm going to do that. And uh, once I got in and uh, my wife, Carrie, uh, you know, once we kind of started seeing each other and 9-11 happened when I was actually um, just starting my Mew. Uh, you know, I remember waiting. What, up, what's, what's a Mew for the audience? Uh, it's a Marine Expeditionary Unit. So – you know, at any given point, pre-9-11, uh, we've always got these ships floating around out in the water that's got marine units on them, and they're what we call the tip of the spear. You know, they're they're ready to hit land anywhere at any given time and and start the start the fight, start the party. And uh and that's what a Mew does. So you've always got marine units um training to rotate out on those things. They typically last, you know, six months at the time. And then another trained unit that had done a workup would come in and take their place. And then the rotation starts all over again. And uh, that's what we was there to do. I was with the 31st Mew. And, um, you know, there was nothing going on at the time. You know, I remember I was waiting up, you know, at night being on the other side of the world to call my wife when all this, you know, when the first plane hit, hit the towers. And, you know, I remember they had it on TV and we were watching it and it's like, wow, that's, that's crazy. It just hadn't sunk in yet. And, uh, I remember watching, watching it on TV when the second plane hit. And like I said, that was when it got real, you know, you're Marine infantry, you're on a Mew waiting to get on ship. I mean, it, it just got as real as it could get. You it's know. go time, baby. Yep, yep. And, you, and it's like you knew it. Like you, you, you could feel it. Like, uh, you know, and it, that was probably one of the most real feelings I'd had in my life at that moment. You know, because when I went in, went in the infantry, there wasn't anything going on. Um, 
you know. So anyways, uh, long story short, you know, you can imagine bases scrambling. Everyone's being called back to their barracks. And I mean, just uh, chaos. Um, the base just looked, Camp Hansen just looked totally different after that second plane hit hit the towers. And um, I was unable to call my wife. You know, they shut all that down. And uh, we weren't supposed to get on ship for like three weeks. And um, that changed. That that got uh, sped up uh, really quick. And uh, so at any rate, so we go to get on ship and um, not knowing where we're going, what we're doing. Uh, we just knew we were going to be doing something somewhere. And uh, believe it or not, um, we actually didn't end up going uh, to the Middle East. Um, I got on ship and kind of had what I would consider a regular Mew experience, you know. Uh, hit a few Liberty ports, uh, went to East Timor a um, couple of times, and uh, and was getting ready to rotate back to CONUS. And, um, and at that point, I really just wanted, I kind of shifted my thoughts off of recon. You know, I'm newly married. I just wanted to get home and be with my wife and stay in the infantry and just continue building from there. But, you know, when we, when we got back to the States and I got back with my unit and, uh, again, I, I got promoted, picked up Sergeant, uh, my duties started changing a little bit started going from being more of a machine gunner to a, to a, a section leader, a platoon sergeant type, because guys were coming and going and, you know, doing more of the paperwork and the stuff that wasn't so fun, uh, having to answer to the higher-ups for guys that were, weren't were doing right. And, um, Those Lance Corporal Third Awards. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, which – the tough thing for me was those were my buddies. They were who I came in with. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I'm kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And uh, so uh, this is about the time that the talks of invading Iraq started coming up. And uh, things started getting shipped overseas. And we got our new dump of, you probably remember, uh, boots in. You know, we'd already been in for a couple years and our seniors had rotated out and we got the new guys in now. And and this is, like I said, we were talking about going over to Iraq and, and doing the thing, you know. And, you know, I, we get these guys in and just, you know, it's like some of them didn't really want to go. You know, I mean, being a Marines, it's just like, well, we're going to war. And it's like, yeah, you're Marine infantry, man. This is what we we're, we're here to do. And, uh, you know, in, in every, every military group, there's a couple of, there's a couple of guys that don't really, really, truly belong. Somehow they, they get through it. I don't know how they survive Marine boot camp of all things and make it through SOI, but they get through and, and they just don't seem to belong. They don't want to be there. And, uh, man, that stuff just really frustrated me. And I remember going home, my wife being five months pregnant at the time, uh, sitting down and talking with her and saying, hey, you know, I kind of got away from my thoughts of wanting to go recon. And, uh, you know, if I'm going to go war, I want to go with a group of guys that want to be there, you know. Um, and uh, I'd like to go with the best. Like, I want to, you know, this. I just had that heart's desire to, I, I wanted to be in it. And um, we made the decision to kind of go that route. And uh, so I, go, I went in and found out that First Force was having a screening, uh, I think, two weeks from that date. I found out everything I needed to know about it. And I went in and talked to my first sergeant, and he was like, hell no, you're not going anywhere. You're going to stay here, leave Marines. And I mean, just my heart went in the dirt, man. I just like, oh, I don't want to be here. I want to be over there. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so he kind of mocked me a little bit, made fun of me, kind of made me feel bad for wanting to leave, you know, made me feel like I was abandoning my my people. And uh, so there was a first sergeant in our battalion who was a recon Marine. And um, I uh, I went and saw him a couple of days later. I just caught up with him and asked him if I could 
have some of his time to talk about recon. And of course he, you know, fired right up and it's like, yeah, meet me over here at this time. And I went and sat down in his office and kind of told him what was going on. And, uh, you know, he kind of let me know. He said, well, my understanding is, is I think your first sergeant's going on leave next week. He said, you should go talk to your company commander because he always wanted to be a recon Marine. But he looked at me, he said, but let me tell you something, devil. He said, I better not, you better not tell nobody I told you. (laughs) I I don't want this shit circling back to me. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, I'm already kind of somewhat laying myself on a chopping block here. And uh, so uh, as soon as my first sergeant went on leave, I went right in there and talked to my company commander and uh, told him what I wanted to do. And man, he was motivated about it as I'll get out. You know, he, he gave me permission to go over and take the screening I went over and took the screening and passed it. Uh, they gave me temporary orders to come over to Forrest and be in the, the RIP platoon. And two, two things. Um, let's talk about what is the screening and what is RIP platoon. For the audience, many of them – well, you and I have discussed this. Is A lot of people don't really know what recon is in the Marine Corps, let alone a lot of Marines don't even know what recon is in the right. Marine Corps, right? So. Let's, we don't have to make sausage out of it, but just a kind of brief overview. What is the screening? What is its purpose? And then what is RIP and its purpose? Right. So uh, the screening, basically in recon units, um, they don't have a lot of time to waste. So they, they run a screening and all the screening is, is it's like a, a PFT, some basic swimming qualifications. And then they just kind of talk to you to make sure you're not a, you're not a dipshit, if I, you know. And it's a free country, baby. You can say whatever you yeah. want on this microphone. <laughs> well, and, and that's that's pretty much what they tell you in the screening is like, look, we just need to make sure you're competent, you can run, swim, and you're not an idiot, and and then we'll allow you to come try out. And uh, so it basically just keeps them from having to weed through a bunch of people that were never going to make it anyway. And uh, that's the screening. So once you pass the screening. Um, you got TAD orders, temporary additional duty orders. I got them for 90 days, basically three months. And uh, they give you three chances to pass the NDOC. And the NDOC is pretty much kind of a rite of passage. It doesn't really end there. It just kind of starts there. I was about to say beginning to suck 101. Yeah. Everybody thinks it ends up there. They're like, no, no. It, just, it just goes downhill from it, there. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> and uh, – and that's what they do. They give you three chances to pass the end dock. And when I got my TAD orders cut to me, um, I was put in the RIP platoon, Recon Indoctrination Platoon. And uh, kind of listening to Kaz Meyer's previous podcast is basic way to say it is, is you got this group of Marines over here that aren't really, you know, one of us yet. You know, like everybody just, they're different. We talk to them different. Uh, we treat them different. Uh you know, they're just not one of us. And uh, basically, you see the RIP platoon each day. Those guys are just living the suckiest life that they could be living in that moment. They, it's nothing but a haze fest. That's all it is. <laughs> that's all it is. You get talked to like crap. You're, you're rucking and running around with a ruck pack everywhere you go and swimming. And I mean, it's just Tying not, every knot under yeah, the sun. That's the, all you do, man. Yeah. And uh and uh, so at any rate, I got cut orders to be in that. And uh, I was back at my unit, back at 2-5, checking out. And my first sergeant had come back off of leave. And he saw me walking around and said, hey, devil, what's going on? How's it? What's been happening? And he sees kind of what I'm doing. And he's like, what's going on here? I'm like, oh, hey, first sergeant. I'm like, uh, I went and took the screening and passed the screening. So I've got TAD order. And I mean, Dude, he he went off like a missile, man. I mean, just berated me, had me at parade rest, and was just chewing me out right there on the parade deck. And uh, you know, and and that went on for for the few days I was checking out. I mean, it was just you know made me feel about an inch tall. Um, at any rate, he let me know when I was actually headed out. He said, "You you better hope." You make it through that end dock. He's because like, if you come back, you come back, you are, you, it's it with you. And, uh, and I get it. You know, I kind of went behind his back, um, you know, which is something you don't, you don't do in the Marine Corps. You respect the rank, but, 
Um, but it, I, I went over there and the crazy thing was, was I showed up and checked into the unit with my TAD orders and the end doc was actually taking place that Friday. And I think this was like a Tuesday and I'm thinking, well, you know, they're going to put me in the rip platoon and I'll probably have my first run at it next month. Oh no. They're like, well, man, get your stuff ready because D days on Friday. And I'm like, well, I just got here. And they're like, good. <laughs> and uh, so I showed up that Friday and, uh, and uh, was ready ready to to do the deed, and there was sixteen Marines there taking the in dock that day, um, and only if I remember correctly, I think only like six or seven of us completed it. Uh, the other ones didn't even finish, and out of the six or seven of us that completed it, there was only four of us that got selected. Uh, There's like two or three other guys that. They completed it, but they just didn't hit the marks that they were looking for. So this this is an important part that I don't think, again, even Marines understand this, is just because you can run, jump, and swim, and just because you're a masochist and you could take some pain does not mean you're going to get you're going to get the secret token to the cool club, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and because, and the way I've always kind of summed this up is. Because you're constantly being evaluated and tested. Yes. Right? And the way I've, I've kind of always summed it up is you have two types of people in this world. Those who can figure things out if you show them how to figure things out. And then those who just have that natural ability to figure things out. Yes. And the ones that don't have that natural ability to figure things out is like you're talking about is we don't have time to go teach you this stuff. So we're looking for people that have the natural ability to figure this out yes. and can run, jump, and swim and are too dumb to quit at anything in their life anyways, yes. right? That, that's it. Uh, you hit the nail on the head with, with the character and the ability that they're looking for. And uh, and that's that's kind of really what the end doc is kind of all about. Um, I, I guess I want to kind of use the idea that it's somewhat traditional – um, but it's really a rite of passage, you know, and again, you got to realize that this company is about to, they got to send you to a lot of training schools before they can make you an operator and put you in a team. Let's, uh, let's just kind of quickly go through, go through that, right? Because we could sit here and make a 16 episode thing on what it is to be a recon, oh, yeah. but just kind of s- quickly skip through like, Hey, all right, you're here. Now you're going to go to BRC and so forth, so forth, so forth. Right. That's it. So yeah. that that's, so once you do that, um, you're, you pass the end doc, you're still not really a recon Marine. Okay. It's not over. This is just the beginning. As you said, um, you have to pass BRC basic reconnaissance course and it's in Coronado. Uh, it's on the same base that the SEALs do their buds at. You know, we're out there swimming the same time they are. Um, but you got to pass BRC, which is right at three months of just really to me, that's, that's the end doc. That's, you know, that's just end doc at the company's just one day. BRC is just, I mean, it's three months of can you survive this and, and meet the marks. And, um, and then once you pass BRC, if you pass BRC, uh, my class started with 56 Marines and we only graduated 19 of us. So, um, to give you an idea, um, which, you know, you know mm-hmm. how it is already, but after that usually comes SEER school, uh, SEER school is the survival evasion resistance and escape school. Navy runs. It's about two weeks. Uh, you basically wander around in the field, eating bugs and grass and, then you go into the POW camp and get slapped around a little bit, and then they graduate you. Um, and then jump school, and you go through your insertion schools, base, your basic insertion schools, which was jump school, and then you go through combat dive school in Panama City for two months. Um, and that's where, you know, me and Kaz went to dive school together. Yeah. And uh, that's, a, that's a fun school. <laughs> and uh so that's that's the basic overview of hey you know you made it in you pass these schools and again all of them are like their own little end doc you, mm-hmm. you don't get dropped from those schools and sent back to your company it's that's not good yeah um you know they have no problems just canning you and sending you somewhere else 
Um, but they spend a lot of money and time sending you these places. And then a lot of times you'll get dropped into a team as an operator, as a scout, a six man team. And, uh, and that's kind of what, what my story was, you know, the invasion of Iraq happened while I was in BRC and I kind of felt like, dang, I'm, you know, there's that part of me that's like, I don't really pray for war. I don't really think anyone does, but I, I had this, part of me that felt like I was missing, missing out, you know, I mean, we had a lot of operators in the company were over there and here I am in BRC and I just left my infantry unit and they're over there and I'm like, and I'm over here and, you know, getting hazed and going through school and, um, you know, so that, that was kind of a bummer. Um, but, but I remember Cass said something in his podcast that there was plenty of war to go around. <laughs> and, you know, you know, they, they all went over there in the invasion and we just kind of whooped it on. Yeah, and, it wasn't like first Gulf, you know, it was over in 96, right? Yeah. Which was kind of the litmus test, right? Because you go, well, the last one we were at, we were done, you know, oh. on a long weekend. And, and then, yeah, and instead, 20 years later. Yeah, and by the time I finished my schools and me and Cass got out of dive school, and we're back at the company. And, you know, we're kind of schooled up and ready to get, get dropped in a team. And, you know, all these guys are coming back from Iraq and it's just like, oh man, like you just felt like you're in the rip platoon all over again. <laughs> you weren't, you weren't with us, you know? And it's like, well, you know, but, uh, it's funny cause they declared the war over and, you know, there's about a year or so where we just wasn't too much going on over there and started getting kind of heated up again. And that's when they decided to send a wave of Marines back over there. And my platoon was selected to go over there as part of that, you know, kind of a, some dark humor is, you know, we're, I'm in a team with guys that were over there for the invasion and they're poking on you like, Oh, you missed out on the real war. We're going over there for sloppy seconds. And <laughs> it's just like, Oh man, this is terrible. Which anybody that doesn't understand this is that's a, not only a part of being in the military, let alone being in the Marine Corps, but being in the infantry, let alone recon is like, you bust each other's chops and just razz each other as much as you possibly can. Why? Because it's fun. And if you're not on the giving end of it, you're on the receiving end of it. <laughs> Always. You're one or the other. There's no in between. Nobody gets to be neutral on that one. Yeah, and nobody's Switzerland in this. <laughs> yeah, no, not not at all. And uh, it, the worst you can imagine, that's what gets said. And, and uh, you know, your feelings do not exist, especially in those units. Um you know, but that's, that's kind of where your bond and brotherhood's built. And, uh, but yeah, just like I said, felt like you were in rip all over again. And, uh, like you, you missed out, you're not one of us. And, and so my platoon got selected to go over to Iraq and there's other interesting parts of my personal life going on at the time when, when all this was happening. But, uh, as an operator, uh, that's really what I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, we went over there and this is probably when probably a lot of your listeners probably remember when Fallujah was probably the nonstop talk on TV at the time. That's when I was over there and we got over there and wasn't really expecting a whole lot. You know, we're cruising through town and this is back when the Humvees and the trucks didn't have any up armor on them at all. And we just started getting blown up left and right. I mean, just non-stop the cat teams the infantry had some cat teams over there and one of them was completely dismantled in like two weeks um you know they the few guys that had survived um were so messed up that they were sh they were sending them back to the states like it was just this because I mean, of the ieds and just the, yeah, yeah i mean the ieds and and the way rpgs that, and everything else yep, yeah yeah because a lot of times they didn't just blow you up you know it followed up with rockets and gunfire and everything else and you know war and uh kind of went over there not anticipating that you know really kind of thought why exactly are we coming over here it's not that i didn't want to come i just thought is there not somewhere else we could be better used and sure enough you know like i said like kaz said there, there's there was still plenty of war to be had and um so we got over there and was part of that front end of the up armor being shipped over there while I was over there. So you started seeing some trucks with it, some without it. You know, we'd be cruising through town, headed back to 
the fob. And I mean, guys would just get down in the truck. There, there weren't a lot of gunners just sitting up on guns. We would just kind of duck our head down <laughs> behind the blast plates because you never knew when you were just going to get hit. And, uh, you know, so uh, we, we did quite a bit of ops while I was over there in Iraq. And, uh, you know, actually, I was actually in a truck that ran over a double stack mine and blew the entire back end of my truck out. And uh, l- lucky I'm even here. The fact that I've got all my fingers and toes and limbs is kind of a miracle. A lot of our brothers weren't that lucky, were no, they? No, they were not. No, they were not. Um, like my ancestors, si- big military and trust. Yes. Yeah. We'll leave them out. Yeah. My my situation was like lightning striking. It was just I don't know how how I was, you know, that number that got blown up the way that I did and was not harmed in any way to a degree. I mean hearing and things like that. But I don't consider those injuries. You know, we see so many people come back completely. Did you get a TBI out of that? I did. Yeah. I did. Traumatic brain injury for the audience that's yes, you know, out there listening. Which this is still early on days of not not the research we have on traumatic brain injuries now, you know. Right. It was a modified headache. Hey, you're good. Dust it off. Go. And then now the things that we're learning of what TBIs are generating as far as health Yes. You know, for us now. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, sorry. Yeah. And even the VA now, you know, they're improving just like everything else is, you know, they, they continuously are doing more studies on it and things like that. So, but again, for, for me also being a Marine and seeing the unfortunate case for a lot of other, uh, Marines, uh, I, I just, for me, those aren't really considered real injuries, you know, like I, I'll take that, you know, it's, uh, but um, we were blown up several, several times over there, uh, firefights and all the whole gamut, everything you're seeing on TV. I mean, it was real. Um, it wasn't just in Fallujah. I mean, there was a lot of these outlawed towns. We were working in a town called Husayba. It was on the Syrian border. And uh, that was a hot spot. It, it was spot. nasty. Very nasty. That's a hot spot there. Yeah. There wasn't yeah. a lot of news coverage over there. No. And uh, we did most of our work was there, and it and it was you know as a rough rough town, and um, so um, a lot of that type of work when I was over there, ambush patrols, counter ID placement, things like that, um, you know, kind of a wild time to be in Iraq. Now it never got any better. You know, we was over there for twenty years, Afghanistan as well, but. Um, the way that they operated and, and uh, improved over time, you know, uh, again, Kaz and uh, a couple of other buddies I had that stayed in that, that Kaz and I have share, uh, you know, I always got the scoop on them from them whenever they came back, you know, the way that they would tackle certain things got better over time, you know, like it does in any war you learn. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my, my, my stint, when I came back from Iraq, um, my decision to get out of the Marine Corps was more based upon my broken marriage at the time. You know, I, I extended my contract so I could go to Iraq. Um, I didn't re-enlist because I chose that once I deployed, I was going to come back to Fort Worth so I could be a part of my kid's life. I, I didn't want my son to grow up and not know me or, you know, um, and I came back to Fort Worth and just really kind of struggled to get my feet leveled out. You know, I hated the world, you know, like most of these guys do. I mean, most of us do anyway. You know, you come out of the Marine Corps, you just, you hate everything. <laughs> You're supposed to. <laughs> and uh, so, like, you think it's normal, you know, yeah. and, and it is for us. Yeah. But it's not in the civilian sector. It's not normal at all. And that's where the struggle is for a lot of, you know, a lot of my buddies is just, you know, they can't plug in because it, we're different. And uh, that's really where the frustration was setting in for me is it's like, man, it's, everybody's just on their own program out here, you know, and, and everybody's not really watching each other's back like I was used to. You know, I was used to, I got your back, you got mine. We don't even have to discuss this. And that was just super, super frustrating for me for, for quite a while. And, uh, Things leveled out and, you know, I kind of learned to adapt and accept it. You know, that's what we do. And, uh, and I started focusing on um, uh, 
getting into HVAC. I'm a mechanical guy. I like that kind of stuff. Um, took me about a year or so to kind of figure out that's a route that I wanted to go. And um, I started working kind of part-time for a local company. Uh, great guy, great outfit. Um, but I got in there and saw how well this guy was doing. And I got looking around and I'm like, I can do a better job than this. And uh, so I completely shifted everything to that focus. You know, I was going to the junior college out here. I didn't want to go to trade school. I went to the junior college, uh, finished the program, did my time. The state gave me permission to test for my license. And, um, you know, my my would have been my ex-wife at the time because uh, I did come home to focus on my son. I started doing more of that. Her and I just started spending time together again, man, trying to be, hey, let's be a real team for him. And, uh, you know, we just never really could leave each other alone. You know, like like we like to fight with each other. <laughs> you know, it's like I tell everybody all the time, I'm like, you know, I'm going to fight with somebody. I, I want to fight with her. I don't want to fight with anyone else. I want to fight with her. And, and uh, you know, I, I woke up one morning with this bright idea that, hey, you know, I, I never really stopped loving her. and. Uh, kind of went, things are going good in my life and I'm moving forward and I just started being self-employed and, and, uh, I kind of approached her with, Hey, you know, how about we work this back out? And, you know, her, her immediate response was hell no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've been on this train once before. <laughs> yeah. She's I, I like it just the way it is. And, and, you know, for her, her, what you would call quote PTSD with m me, Dealing with me during all of that was, you were a monster to me. And she was like, no, I, I, I don't ever want to go back down that road again. You were terrible. And, um, you know, I just kind of stayed at it, you know, how we do. I'm like, nah, I'm like. Too dumb to quit at anything. I told her. I told her. I said, no. Nah. I said, we're going we're gonna to work this out. She looked at me like I was nuts, you know. And, and uh, so, you know, several weeks. If I think it went on to the better part of almost two months that I just didn't let it go. And it, and we actually started kind of having some severe problems again, you know, like uh, fighting quite a bit over it. And, and uh, you know, she uh, – I, I think it was Thanksgiving maybe. And I had to kind of back off because she started getting where she was like, listen, I'm you take him and y'all go. I'm not – we're not going to do this. And uh, I kind of backed off a little bit. She let her guard down, and and uh, I, I hit her up and said, "Hey, let's can I talk to you for a little bit?" And, you know, and that was the final conversation. I sealed the deal right there. <laughs> and I think it was six months later we got remarried in 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 my church, and uh, kind of shocked everybody because we didn't tell anyone. We went in and talked to the pastor and said, "Hey, look, you know, we got a unique story here, and uh, we don't really want to." we're not going to take a whole lot of time to do this. Everyone knows us, uh, you know, and he just kind of, everybody showed up for an evening service one Sunday and little did they know they were showing up. My wedding was the service. And uh, so really neat deal the way he incorporated, you know, reconciliation in. And, you know, I'm not saying that's for everybody. Some couples just don't belong together. Uh, but for her, uh, and me, like I said, you know, if, if you hang out with us, we bicker a lot. We get at each other. Uh, but like I said, I I want to fight with her. I don't want to fight with anybody else. And uh, and I think that's where the audience listening is. The, don't take the words as the wrong context, right? Yeah. Is to be married to guys like you and me and Cash and many others that we know. It takes a special kind of human to want to do that because we are wired different. And by the way, the wiring never changes. No. It's there for life, right? Yeah. And But let me ask you if this is a fair statement. Like even when I look at Laura's, she's helped me learn to manage my internal wiring better than when I was managing it on my own. Because if I didn't have somewhere to go fight, it was just, you know, idle hands with the devil's hands, right? Yes. And um, and contrary to what a lot of people might think, too, is, you know, when when most operators don't spend 20, 30 years in, 
you know, there, there, it's, there, there, that's not, that's not a con. When you see somebody like Cass get out of 20 years, you're like, damn, man, you did the full boat on that thing? Like, yeah. holy cow. And, but even though we might get out after an enlistment with an extension or two enlistments or whatever, we don't, and, and, and I've even talked about this on some of my other episodes is, yeah, you can like me and love me and everything else, but also remember Marine Corps invested a lot of time into me to become very good at delivering violence more than anybody else. Yes. Right? Very and it's true. one of those things that the stripes on a tiger, you don't change the stripes on a tiger. Right. And matter of fact, I had one smart ass one time go, well, you know, you could hair dye them. And I was like, yeah, but you'll get mauled to death trying that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And so the wiring stays with us because it is – Regardless of how introverted, extroverted, personable, not personable we are, a lot of people don't see that behind, you know, the actual eyeballs, nose, and skin on our face is what's going on between our ears. That wiring, it's 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 always there. Yeah. And having someone that can understand that means huge things to guys like us, right? Like yeah. like. There is no one on this planet that I am more loyal to than my wife just for that alone. Yeah. Because while the most time, the older we get, like you said, you know, time goes on, but it's still that uh, what I call the ugly three armed green gorilla raises its head every once in a while. Right. Yeah. And, and, it, and, it, and, it, and so, and they, they know how to go, Hey, or sometimes when they're like, Hey, Turns out this is a good time to go do a girl's trip yeah. <laughs> right? because they know it might be a time of the year. It might be, hey, just found out so-and-so, something happened to them or, or, or whatever, right? You yeah. know, and, uh, and so that's why I want the audience to understand is our spouses are in just the most incredible human beings there are yes, on, on the planet, yeah. right? And, 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 you know, and, and here's the thing is, here it is, is, you got an incredible spouse, and one thing that you both damn sure had in common is you wanted the best for your boy. Yes. Right? Yeah. And so you get into HVAC, you're starting your own gig, you've conned her into marrying you again. Yep. Right? yep, yep. Pulled it off. <laughs> she probably looked up and was like, hey, whoa, what yeah. just happened yeah. here? <laughs> and then now you're doing your own business. Yes, sir. Okay. So, and we're going to, we're going to spend some minutes talking about the importance of HVAC and what the audience needs to know about this. Because, I mean, hell, even though I've been the top producer in Sotheby's for coming up on four years in a row and I've sold a lot of houses, just even what I've learned from you is like, I had no idea. Like, this is important for the consumer to understand and know these things. But uh, so you you get the business started. How does that go? So uh, not real. You know, I didn't really have a plan. Um, like I think most people that start a business would, you know, a lot of, a lot of guys would probably go down after several years of experience and, you know, get loans and, um, get loans on trucks and open up a shop and drop loans on advertisement and stuff like that. And I didn't really do that. Um, you know, I kind of just scraped by and, you know, got jobs as I got them and, uh, uh, built really kind of built from there. Um, <clears throat> my dad does this stuff as well. Um, I think he's kind of getting a little closer to what you would consider retirement. Um, he just has worked really hard all of his life, but my dad's always just kind of done the work itself. That was the model I had growing up. You know, my dad was not the get 50 people working for you and grow, 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 grow. He just never trusted anyone to do a good job for him because my dad just, you know, he was a master of his craft. He did great work. And uh, his customers wanted him. They didn't want his helpers. They wanted him, you know, because they knew what they was getting out of him. And that's the model I had growing up. Um, and that was kind of the model I took on as uh, I moved forward with my HVAC business. I just thought, hey, you know, kind of the Marine, the way I was raised, the way my dad was, was you just get in there and you grind, grind, grind. You never turn down a job. You do the job better than you told the people you would do it. And all these things are so cliche for, 
I know for sure for contractors to say, but is the honest to God's truth with the way I was raised, uh, my route in the military, and just the company that I've been fortunate to keep, you know, um, you know, my my greatest friends I've got were Marines, you know, and a portion of them that I see routinely are recon guys. So, you know, we just kind of, our friendship holds us all to a high standard. And I kind of got that outlook too, you know, like I just really struggle to trust people to do a good job for me. I've had several of mechanics work for me over the years, and I've been very fortunate to have some of the best DFWs had to offer. Um, if I could clone most of all of them, uh, and I was smarter than I am, I probably could have been one of these hundred employee type businesses. But the problem is, is I just don't trust people to do a good job. That's probably my biggest hang up, but that's also been my biggest asset. My customers know when they call, uh, they know that they're getting me. They know that no matter what, I'm going to make sure it's okay. And I'm going to take care of it and do you a really good job. And, um, and it kind of goes really not just back from what you learned out of your dad, but being on a team, yeah. right? Because like when you and I and other guys are sitting here talking about this stuff is it doesn't just stop even after a deployment, right? Is no. you, you show up every day, yep. right? You are, you are on the block every single day and, and it doesn't just stop just because, hey, we're hanging out right yeah. and that and that carries on with us right yeah. is and that's why like, when you and i joke around it's like that's what makes it really hard for us to trust people is because when you've been around the most where trust was never even a question and then you get to the civilian world and people are just not like you said not looking after your back or any of this and it's just like i just want to make sure that my client gets the absolute best and unless i have the confidence that somebody's going to deliver the same thing i'm going to deliver then it's just not worth it to even have them in it, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's kind of been, you know, really my biggest thing is, is as I've done work for customers and I've got customers that, you know, uh, that live in three, four and $5 million homes here in the Metroplex. And they're just really weird about who they let in their home, you know, uh, for obvious reasons. We know how, we know how the world is. We know how contractors are. Um, you know, they're not always, not always honest. Um, we see this, you see this in your industry all the time and it's just the world we live in. Again, this is the biggest struggle when I got out because I'm used to everybody looking the same, acting the same, having the same, uh, principles and philosophy. And, and then you get out and it's like, everybody's just on their own program. Like, like it's cutthroat, you know, like no one cares about each other. It's, I got my back before I got your back kind of thing. And, um, you know, but Getting in and, and, and doing, doing work to its utmost, I want and desire to be the best I can be at what I do. I like to be proud of that. It's not bragging. I just, we all want to feel good about ourselves. And with my work, it's what I hang on to. I, you know, I didn't stay in 20 years like Cass did, you know, but this is what I, I did do. And, and my son being 18 now, you know, he's graduated high school. He's worked for me in the summers. He's got to see that, but he's also got to see the, the part of me that's probably not as healthy. You know, it's a, can be a little bit of an obsession on the job, you know, like I'm be watching who's working for me and constantly trying to show them a better way to do it when the way they was doing it really was good, but there's a better way and, and just, um, you know, can be kind of overwhelming sometimes for people. Like you said, it goes back to the way we're wired. Yeah. We don't know it any different. And that obsession is such, that's who we are. We, we, we're good at what we do because we're obsessed. Right. right? And that's why when Kaz, right, it is we making these acquisitions and then he was like, hey, do we have an HVAC guy? And I was like, I mean, yeah, we got a couple people that we're using. And he's like, Nick's got a company. And one of the things that definitely made it a no-brainer for me was I'm operating really quick. My job is to scale. And I need to be surrounded by people that I can trust and that know how to take autonomy to the next level. That can also in return trust that I'm going to do my part for like you. Like, 
Like when I was like, hey, man, I've got checks. Yeah. Like, and you're like, I'm not even done with the job. And I was like, I don't care. You're getting paid. Right. Like, let's, let's, yeah. let's do this. Because for me, one, I, you know, it was like, it was funny. Even Peterson said last night is it, when we were with Ricky, who's both, you know, Marines as well. And, uh, and he told Ricky, he goes, yeah, if, if Span does anything, he makes sure everybody gets paid. Right. Yeah. Because as a saying that I've said on this show and I tell my daughter all the time. Time is a commodity you cannot buy more of and you can't get a refund on it once spent. Reputation cannot be bought with money but only be built with time. But you can ruin it in a matter of seconds and over a single dollar. And so that's why it's always really important for me. And you were like, well, I'm not done with the job. I was like, yeah, but I, I don't care because I already know what I'm going to get out of you. So, I, you know, this is not a – a typical, hey, I need to see that the job and the work was done correctly for me to compensate somebody for doing that. I was like, no, I already know what I'm going to get. Here's the checks. Because now for me, it allows me as, as, as a business professional to go even faster and scale even more because I can check that box and go, okay, I got next checks out. I can go to the next, right? And then you don't have to worry about anything because you're like, okay, I'm going to go do what I'm good at. Hell, I already got the money. So I'm going to flow forward, right? right? And it doesn't hurt that, well, there's a lot of Marines that are involved and even some of the largest check writers, Marines themselves. So they're like, yeah, you do it, do what you're going to do. So it, it, it was a level of comfort for me to be able to go, wow, I can breathe again, right? So when Kaz and I built Stacks Property Services together, I was like, as soon as I've got him up to speed on what his mission is, then I don't have to worry about it anymore. He's yeah. got it, right? Yeah. Ricky, he's got it. Peterson's got it. You got it. Yeah. Scott's got it. All, you know, I, and then because that means I can stay hyper focused on scaling us. Yeah. And, and that's why it was just a sense of relief. And it's not like the last age that guy did a bad job or anything. But I didn't know them, and and look, just anybody is only as good as their last job, right? right, right. You know, I mean, it, actually, I was going to say something really inappropriate, and then I realized I, <laughs> that I'll tell you that one offline, and you'll you'll <laughs> laugh, right? And, and, um, so anyhow, is I was like, okay, so that's the thing for the audience to understand is you're not you're not just Nick Wright. The Marine Corps veteran who owns an HVAC company. For me, you're way more than that. You're my trust element that I don't have to think about things, yeah. right? And if I don't have to think about it, then I can be hyper focused. And if there's anything that you and me understand, is that environment is what kind of advancement that gives you, right? right. What kind of just punch through whatever barriers there are because you don't have to look to your left or right to wonder, is that person doing what they're supposed to be doing? Right. So as folks like yourself and Kaz and Peterson and Ricky and Scott have come a part of this element is it's, it, it, it's like the vessel is HVAC. Yeah. You, you, you are that element that I don't have to worry about that. And that's, what's so important and what's really just super sexy about it is anybody out there listening right now, if this is what I'm getting out of Nick, guess what? You don't have to be a recon Marine to get it either. Right. You're going to get it because this is how Nick does business with anybody. Right. Right. And, and, and so, and it was kind of funny because like, even remember in the beginning, like you would be like, all right, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're doing it. I was like, I don't care, dude. Like, yeah. <laughs> dude, first off, I don't care about details in the first place. And I was like, you, you yeah. look, just tell me where I give you the checks, right? Yeah. <laughs> because and now that I have that trust for this element, not just in the ones that need work, but as, as we're doing acquisitions and how much I've learned from you, just even the last several weeks, what I've learned on HVAC was like, whoa, hold on. And that was another reason why I wanted to get you in here to talk about your journey, how you got to where you're at, right? right. But I also wanted the audience to understand, we got a trustworthy person who's demonstrated trust his entire life to go, this is what you, the consumer, need to know about HVAC systems. And 
So let's let's talk about a a, a couple of things. One, if you're a home buyer right now, what is the number? I mean, and I know there's 50 things we we, we could tell folks, but what is the number one thing when somebody's buying a house now that you would tell them when it comes to the HVAC? You need to need to understand this. So uh, we've had some a massive change in our industry this last decade, and uh, we've had a transition of going from what most air conditioners ran off of for quite a while was R22. Most everybody you talk to that does not work in the HVAC industry, a homeowner, uh, investor, uh, whichever, they're going to refer to it often as you'll hear it called Freon. Okay, Freon's just a name brand. All right, that's all it is. Like uh, like shoes, you've got Nike, Reebok, uh, Adidas. Those are just name brands, but they all make shoes. Freon's just a company that produced uh, R22, DuPont, another name brand. But you'll hear it called Freon. Um, R22 is a uh, chemical that the EPA decided to start phasing out in 2010. Okay, 2010 was the beginning of a 10-year phase out. Come January of 2020, they were not allowed to produce another drop of it. That was the goal. So everything started switching over to 410A. Uh, 410A is the new refrigerant. The biggest difference is, is 410A does not have chlorine in it. Uh, R22 has chlorine in it, and most air conditioning systems of age have got some sort of leak in them somewhere. And again, the contribution to, you know, uh, environmental improvement is trying to, you know, do away with some of that. Um, 410A, um, if you have a system on a house that you're looking at purchasing that has an R22 unit. Keep in mind, we're we're in 2021 now, fixing to cross over into 22. Um, this phase out, I mean, it stopped in January of last year. So the R22 refrigerant, if you can find it anywhere right now, is going to cost anywhere from about $1,000 to $1,500 for a 30-pound jug of it. It's expensive if you can even find it. To give the audience an idea, 10 years ago, what would that have cost for a 30 pound? Oh, maybe $85. Okay. Maybe $85. And now at a minimum, it's going to cost you a grand. If you can find it. If you can find it. If you can find it. And uh, so again, keeping in mind, they produced as much of it as they could up till January of 2020. Okay. And we've used it since then. So the stockpile's gone way down, which means the price goes up. And uh, so if you're looking at buying a home and you have a, um, a home inspection person going in and looking at the house, one thing that you need to ask yourself about the air conditioner is, is what type of refrigerant is it running off of? Okay. I don't care how clean it looks. I don't care how much maintenance has been done to it. If it's running on R22, you've got a bridge you are going to have to cross in the near future. All that system has to do is develop one leak. And you're either going to spend $200, $250 a pound of refrigerant to get it cooling just for a moment, and it's still going to be leaking, or you're going to have to replace the system because the new machines, the compressors, you can't just dump new refrigerant into it. Like It's, it's like a diesel engine and a gasoline engine. They're just different. And uh, so if you're looking at purchasing a home, it's got an R22 unit on there. You need to factor that in because that is something that you're going to have to address at some point. Just so the audience understands is, if I'm hearing this right, is if you've got an older system with R22, there isn't interchangeable parts that you can just go put in that system to be done with that system, right? There are some scenarios where a system can. Um, Example would be, You know, when you're dealing with an HVAC system on a home, you've got the machine sitting outside. You've got the inside machine that's connected to the machine outside. Okay, the inside machine is what we refer to as the uh, indoor unit, air handler. It's what's moving the air in your house. It's got a coil in it. Um, A lot of older coils would develop leaks. So let's say in the last three, four years, I had a customer that had a leak in a coil. They had an R22 unit sitting outside. Um one of their options would be to just replace the air handler with a new coil in it that does not leak. And a lot of the newer coils can run and connect to an R22 machine 
We just have to put the correct metering device on it for R22. Uh, you see a lot of that in this last five, six years. Okay. Now, what that let that customer with is down the line when the compressor outside blows up or something massive goes wrong with that unit, the indoor unit is compatible with the new refrigerant now. So later on, they can come back and put a new machine on the outside and they're good to go. It's the older coils are not compatible with 410A. So take that same scenario and reverse it. Okay, let's say you've got a 25-year-old unit in a house. Okay, it's R22 only, and then the compressor blows up outside. You can't just replace just the outdoor unit anymore because that the new refrigerant is a higher pressure and the indoor coil is not rated for it. So typically, like right now, if the compressor blows up outside and it's R22, you're replacing your system now. You know, now five years ago, you had some options but not anymore. You know, they're just not producing parts for R22 anymore because it's phased out. Well, let me ask you this. Like, even if you could modify it, is is there a certain point that where the cost to modify it, you might as well replace it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And in in this... Because you're basically putting a Band-Aid on a sucking chest wound that it's eventually... Exactly. Going to go out, right? It, exactly. And, and, th- and it's tough. You know, HVAC is tough because... Um, you know, again, like every other industry, you've got good and you've got bad. You know, everybody wants to sell you a new unit. Okay. That's where we make our biggest money. Everyone wants to sell you a new unit. Okay. Um, and that's where people, you know, that don't know anything about it. They're just like, oh, I'm just being overwhelmed. Everybody wants to sell me a new machine. You know, it's kind of like your car. If you got a flat tire, well, of course, buying a new car solves that problem, but that's not really the necessary fix. And, um, you know, now going back to the Band-Aid, um, as a contractor over the years, what I've learned is, is most people, 80% to 85% of my customer base, which is mostly word of mouth, repeat customers, so I don't advertise anymore. I give them options. You and I discussed this. This yep. is these are your options, regardless who comes out. These are the things you can do. These are the things you should do, and this is why. Um, most people do not think about their HVAC system. Okay, most people buying a home, investors, they walk in, and we're used to being in a car that's comfortable. We're used to being in a building that's comfortable. We're used to being in our homes and being comfortable. We're uncomfortable when we go from one of these things to the other and we immediately get inside and we're expecting to be comfortable. And we are. Um, We're typically the investors will walk into a home or the home buyer and they're comfortable. So they check it off the box. They walk by vents, blowing air out. We're good. That gets completely dismissed. We start looking at kitchen counters, uh, remodeled bathrooms, uh, things like that. Um, and the, the, the problem with the cost is when it's time and the air conditioner has an issue, people are often trying to look at, well, what's my cheapest option to fix this? Well, you can dump 200 pound per dollars per pound of refrigerant here and it may hold for a few months. It may hold for two weeks. And I see customers do this all the time. They don't want to spend money on their air conditioner. We just spent money on a big vacation. We just spent money remodeling this entire place. And it's like, but you left your 30-year-old air conditioner sitting outside, (laughs) you know, and now it's a problem because my house is hot. And in that moment, no one cares how pretty the house looks inside. They just know they're hot and they want to leave. You know, I got customers that will leave their million-dollar home if it's hot and go stay in a $150 a night hotel because it's comfortable, you know, and, uh, and this is the problem here in Texas. So, you know, dumping refrigerant in or even just replacing just a coil, uh, it's kind of like you've, you've got an R22 compressor outside. It, this is something you are going to have to address. If you do it all now, it's cheaper, but if you replace one inside and then come back and do this later, the total cost is going to be more expensive. You know, it's an investment investments are about making money. 
But when it comes to HVAC, people do struggle with that. You know, they would rather spend money on something that they're seeing in their home. You know, what does the house look like? That's typically where people struggle. It's the same with a car. You know, teenagers are really big on how cool does the car look? They don't really care what kind of shape the engine's in. This car looks cool. This is what I want. But the engine's on its last leg, you know, and uh, and that's kind of your home. Your HVAC system's a heart. It's the heart heart of the house. Well, there's another issue that we have now, and you and I had discussed this, which was these need new systems, especially the Jeanette house. Well, actually, not just the Jeanette house, but the the Kell house, yeah. where you were like the Smithsonian called. They want their HVAC system back because this thing is older than Jesus, yeah. right? Yeah. Like I still cannot believe that that thing. Like it was any day that thing was going. Like the fact that I've stretched a year and a half out of it, I I, I don't know how. But um, but you, you were like, hey, we we've got some supply chain issues going on right now. Yeah. We got ships that are off of that that could port right now, but we can't get them out of the sea. Yeah. To drop these containers off, we've got major supply chain issues going on all around the United States. Yeah. Where I remember you, you were like, hey, um. There's like, uh, maybe it was Jeanette. I can't remember which house it was, but you were like, there's like one available right now. Yeah. And if we don't get it, it's not that I don't want to be able to not get to the houses. We may have to sit around and wait Yeah. until we can find more of these. Yeah. Which therefore, because of supply and because of demand, do you want to buy a new HVAC system today where there's 10? Or do you want to buy a new HVAC system tomorrow when there's only one? Yeah. Because the price is different when there's 10 for sale than when there's only one for sale and you got 30 people that need that one. Yes. Right? Yes. I actually have a customer on a waiting list for a unit that's down at their house right now. Like, I can't get this unit for them. And so I actually have them on a waiting list and they're like, just let me know when it gets here and we'll put it on. And now... uh addressing that issue. It's it's just a crazy time for a lot of us, you know, in, in your industry, in my industry, everything pertaining to a home or a building, construction, utilities, uh, any of that stuff is just, is we're in a very wild time. Um, it's not that I haven't been able to get things for customers. It's been different, but buying a home right now, if you've got a unit that you know needs to be addressed, um, you know, we're we're dealing with a shortage of parts um, or there may be an air conditioning system. For example, if you wanted to buy a new vehicle and you said, I want to go get a new vehicle, you want to go get the vehicle you want to get. You want to go pick one. You don't want to be told, OK, well, you can either have this one or this one. This is all we got. You know, that kind of stinks. It's like, well, you can buy a new vehicle, but that's kind of a bummer because you want to be able to sit down and say, hey, since I'm investing in my home, I would like to choose the name brand, the SEER rating. If you've got the money, you want to put in there what's going to add to the value of your home. You don't want to just say, I have to settle for this. The only thing that's left is an off-brand air conditioner that no one installs. The only reason they're installing it now is because it's all that's left. You don't want to be in that position. Um, cost of machines have gone up because of everything going on in the world right now. And, uh, and availability is the scariest part of it. Um, you know, so I tell a lot of people, you know, customers right now, again, dropping, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 grand on an HVAC system is not the fun thing to do. You know, again, we install it, you're back to being comfortable, which is what we're used to doing, but you can't, you're not looking at your HVAC system. You don't, you don't see it. So it's not as fun to enjoy. It's just comfortable, which is to me the most important thing. And, uh, but with that being said, I always tell people if they're, they're looking at buying a home. I've got a lot of customers that will call me out. Hey, we got a home inspector, but I want you to come look at the HVAC for me. I don't care what it costs. I just want you to evaluate it because they've been through this before. That's one of the most immediate hits when somebody moves into a home. And, uh, so what I would say is, is if you've got a unit that's having issues, it's an older unit, um, I wouldn't really sit and tarry on that too long, like especially right now, because I've, I've got customers like, well, we're going to wait and see if things get better. Well, they got worse. The equipment costs went up and availability has gone down. So I've got some customers that wanted to wait a little while, see if it leveled out. Now, if they called right now and said, hey, let's just go ahead and move forward. 
I could move forward for them if they wanted to. Now, again, I deal with certain equipment. Okay. Uh, we can always say, well, we can go over here to the, you know, the cheaper car lot. You know, it's nothing wrong with Kia cars, but they're not Cadillacs. They're not Audis. You know, uh, they're not built the same. And it's like, if you're the kind of person that's like, well, I kind of wanted a Cadillac because I've got the money for it. I was just trying to wait, see if it got a little cheaper. Well, it's like, now there's no more Cadillacs. There's yeah. no more Audis. There's no more Fords, Dodges. All you got is a Kia car. And you're like, well, I really needed a truck. Well, you got a Kia car. This is, if you take it or leave it, this is all that's there. So I would say that if you're, if you know it's a bridge you've got to cross and there's availability. And if you've got a, a good HVAC contractor, even if it's not us, if you've got a good contractor that you trust, um, I would probably consider going ahead and pulling the trigger on that. Because again, you know, when it gets hot here in Texas, it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. I, I've got customers that have told me they'll turn their cable off. Uh, they'll cancel their gym memberships, uh, whatever they got to do to make sure they've got air conditioning in their home here in Texas. You can't sleep in a hot house. No, um, especially when you're a mile from the sun and 110% of humidity, a swamp ass here in Texas. And one, one of the many, many reasons why I, I, I love you, man, is because like on Jeanette, for example, right? It was like, the system's not dead yet, but the shelf life of it is undetermined, right? Right. And it was like, does it need some things? Yes. And I was able to go, what are my options? And you're really great at delivering options. These are your options, right? And I'm like, okay, if I don't replace the system today, what is the risk that I run by not replacing it today? And you were like, well, you're going to have tenants in this property, you know, TCU kids at that who are paying a pretty penny and premium to live in that house if it goes wrong goes out and has to be replaced depending on what time of the year that is and depending on what's going on in supply chains i could have 20 of them or i could be on a 20 week waiting list for mm -hmm. one of them right yep. and but you were able to articulate it in a fashion where i was able to go that risk is not acceptable for me to have to look at tenants and go, I'm sorry, it's going to take longer to do this, that it was a no brainer. Yeah, right. So right. that part of it was, was you, you, you do a really good job of articulating that. What I want the audience to understand is this, this HVAC problem with R22 is not going away. As a matter of fact, it be every day that ticks by, it becomes more of an issue. Even as the depletion of R22 that is no longer to, able to be produced will eventually leave you where you're, you're, you're going to be stuck with something. So one, do you want to be stuck with it at a very inconvenient time? Cause this thing, these things never go out at a convenient, like yeah. they don't go out like right now where you yeah. can just leave your windows open for the next no. two weeks and it doesn't matter. Right. No. You know, it's always like, <laughs> right. Like the last week of July and you're like, yeah. Oh my God, I'm going to melt. Right. And, but also is the investment in that house, right? Because yep. we're all eventually going to sell our houses. Yep. And if you think that your system that you've, yeah, maybe maintained all that, like you were talking about, is keeping going, but now you're, you're going to sell your house. The, your house, to me, is more valuable with them knowing that they don't have to go drop that seven, eight, nine, 10, 12, 15 grand, you know, especially depending on the size of the house. Yes. Right. Of you're investing in this, that you're going to get your money back on it when you go sell the house. Because yeah. if your house is for sale next to your neighbor's house and they got an old system and you've got the new system, people are more likely to want to buy your house because one, it's already got the system in it and it's not going to happen on their watch. Yep. Right. Now, there's one other thing, and it's kind of funny. I, I meant to ask you about this the other day that I'm, I'm sure you run into as well is because Texas is humid and a lot of people like to keep their houses at like 50 degrees, yeah. that creates a lot of moisture. Yep. And that moisture, therefore, creates mold. Yep. So are you seeing a lot of mold problems in some of these, whether it's in the vents or the 
What do you, the the duck work or any of that? So mold, that's a that's a a, a thing that we do deal with in my industry. And um, when you're doing putting an air conditioning and heating system in your home, the design we refer to this as the design, um, the size of the house, uh, the size of the air conditioner. Everybody always thinks, well, just put the biggest air conditioner in you can. Well. That's not the way it works because if we oversize a unit for a home, it will not cool the house correctly. Uh, an air conditioning system is not just designed to cool your temperature in your home. It's designed to remove humidity. Um, humidity can carry bacteria, uh, germs, all kinds of things in it. Um, and the system needs to run for a certain length of time to remove humidity because it, be, it could be 65 in your house, 70. And if it's 85% humidity, it just feels uncomfortable. And I've seen this before. And that's usually the signs of an oversized system. Okay. So when you start seeing mold and duct work, vents, uh, it can end up getting in the sheetrock and everything else. And some of the worse cases is typically a company came in and oversized an air conditioner trying to solve a, a, a problem. Uh, a very uneducated technician, uh, a designer. Um, just trying to make a sale. And we'll just put another, you know, instead of a three ton, we'll just put a four ton or a five ton in here on a 1500 square foot home. And, and that can be severely problematic a year or two down the line. Um, and not to mention that typically you got ductwork vents full of mold and stuff. You typically just start feeling kind of sick inside the home. Um, you know, it, so it's, it's, we don't, if an air conditioner is running correctly, it'll actually lower the humidity levels in the house, regardless of how cold it is in there. We want to remove heat and we want to remove humidity. This is the two big things we don't want in our home. And, uh, in a properly designed air conditioner, there's a lot of science that goes into what size unit belongs in my house. Uh, it's not just put the biggest one in here. We can put the largest thing within a parameter. We can't go outside that parameter. This is just as bad as you'd almost be better off undersizing a unit than oversizing one, if that makes any sense. Well, let's talk about that because we discovered that on one of my properties where you go, when they put this thing in, they, they put too small of a unit, right? Right. right. And yeah. Yeah, and that's uh, over there on that property. Um, it's an interesting thing because, again, you know, uh, prior to you guys taking that property on, it goes back to how people tend to deal with HVAC when they have to cross that bridge. So uh, an older home had an older air conditioner in it. Um, you know, they tackled that by putting, I think it looks like to me, they put what was available. Uh, the cheapest route they could go. They put a good unit in there. It just wasn't the right size. And uh, and again, you can take a Cadillac of an air conditioner, but take a crummy contractor. And I don't care how nice name brand the unit was. If you don't install it correctly, it doesn't work correctly. Well, that's what we learned on the inside unit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Good, good system. But uh, how, did, how did you describe it earlier? It's like having an engine upside down in your vehicle, Yep, right? Yep. Yeah, it's a great engine, but they put it in upside down and backwards and everything else. And it's like, well, it starts up and runs. And it's like, but it's not running the way you want it to run because of these reasons, you know. And, and uh, just poor craftsmanship is what we call it. What's what I refer to it as is a good system. But the craftsmanship on installation was where everything went wrong. And go ahead and let the audience... No, what else you learned while you were up there that I was like, of of course. <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, most of us think, you know, when a, if we're going to remove an air conditioner and put a new air conditioner in, uh, I'm going to remove the old air conditioner and we're going to junk it, whatever that may mean. You know, if you've got a scrapper that wants to come pick them all up or you haul it back to your shop and scrap it down or throw it in a dumpster or whatever it is that you do with it, the customer doesn't want to deal with that. And uh, we're removing it from the house. We're getting rid of this. And again, craftsmanship and what the cheapest price in having an install done can mean a lot of things. And when we got up in the attic 
to relocate the furnace because they installed it in the worst position it could be in. Um, we saw the old furnace left back behind the new furnace in the attic. You know, and this is a large machine. I mean, this is a this is a big, heavy machine just sitting on the rafters up there, you know. So it's like, and the problem is, is the time to get that thing out is when they removed it. Because when the new one went in place, now it's trapped back there. The only way you could get it out is to completely remove the new system so the old one could come out and then reinstall the new system back in place. And you know, and, and like you said, I could do a 16 part series on why this is just terrible all the way around because these machines, you don't want to uninstall them and reinstall them over and over and over. They don't like to be moved around. The more you move a machine around, the worse it is on it. Um, you know, kind of like that machine he had over on that property. Uh, it's a great machine. It's only two years old. There's got to be a good use for this. It, it just wasn't on that house. And uh, so we uninstalled that machine and it just happens to be a good size for the property next door. Uh, so when we tackle that, we're going to use it over there because it does have a use. The good thing is it's next door. So we don't really have to load the machine up in a truck, drive down the highway with it bouncing and jostling around and unload it on another property. We literally are just going to dolly it around the corner and put it on that house so that you know, we're kind of getting away. We're kind of getting away with murder on that one. You, that's a fortunate situation. But the the thing about what we found on that one job is, is if I would, I'm always curious to know how much did that homeowner actually save going this route. You know, uh, quick funny story to that. I've got a longtime customer of mine right now that's used me since day one. And day one, my prices were cheaper than they are now. You know, I've become a master of my craft over years, just like you have yours. And I, I still continue to get better each year. Therefore, our value tends to go up. Um, but I had a customer that I did an install on a three-system house of his in Fort Worth and uh, got a killer of a deal, deal of the century, went in, did him a really good job. That system is still, this almost 16 years later, that system is still running like a champ for the guy. And uh, eventually had me do another system on his home. Long story short, he had me come back about three years later, gave him a bid to replace another unit on the same home. Well, my cost had gone up. I've got guys working for me. I'm starting to build a customer base. And um, man, he said, nah, this is way higher than the other one. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. He had another company come in, installed the unit. I didn't hear from the guy for a couple months. I thought I lost the customer. It happens. About two, maybe three months later, this customer calls me back. He's kind of laughing and beating around the bush. And he says, all right, look, he said, I had a, had a guy come out, install this air conditioner, train unit, great system, Cadillac. He said, but it just is not cooling our master bedroom. And he said, I need you to come out and tell me what's wrong with it. He said, he's been out here several times. He's done several things to it, and it's just not getting any better. So I drive over there, meet with him, take a look at the system, and it goes down to craftsmanship. There's just a lot of marks the guy missed when he installed the machine. So I went around, made a list of what needed to be fixed, corrected, resealed, um, and I go in and I give the guy a price. And I, I don't know, I think maybe it was eight. Eight somewhere eight eight hundred fifty some odd dollars to correct these issues, reseal things up, do some different stuff to the machine, and I go down there and I hand the guy the estimate. At that time, I was handwriting them, and he takes that and he looks at it and he just starts laughing. He turns and looks at his wife and he pitches the estimate on the counter for him. I'm thinking, here we go again. <laughs> he just, you know, and I'm just like, man, I'm 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 done with this guy. You know, I got to move on and. He looks at me and he goes, that's the exact dollar amount I saved by going with the other guy. That is hilarious. That is a true story. Uh, yeah. And this guy has been one of my favorite customers. He has used me since my first year in business. He's stuck with me since then. He doesn't call no one else. He's actually, uh, him and his wife owned a business. They had an employee in there that their home air conditioner went out. And he sent me over there, kind of did, kind of did what you did. Hey, just do it and bill me. I don't yeah. care. And they just took care of it for their, 
their employee. They needed an air conditioning system and they just purchased it for them and had me install it. I ended up replacing the other system on his house. They've referred me to several people, helped me grow my business just through referrals. And he always brings that up too. He always brings that one story up uh, about that unit. And, uh, you know, but, and, and I did those repairs, solve their problem. That unit's been running like a champ for them. It just, a lot of it comes down to craftsmanship. And the thing is, is not only did he not save money because the Delta was 850, but the amount of inconvenience and trips he had to get from the other person to go through all that, he could have just saved a lot of heartache and everything else and paid the same amount. Right? You got it. You yeah. got it. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's my biggest thing for people is dealing with people like yourself, uh, Kaz, uh, contractors. I'm sure you've got some other ones <laughs> that you really trust. Uh, you know, they're not always the cheapest guys, but it's for a good reason. Like you want to be able to say what needs to be done. What are my options? What needs to be done? They're not going to give you an option that they know is not going to work. And they'll tell you the pros and cons to it. And, yeah, you could probably take their price, open up the phone book, get online, do whatever it is you do, call 10 other people to save yourself a hundred bucks or 500 bucks or even a couple thousand in some cases. And there's a reason why I, I've learned over the years that most of these contractors, you know, I've had people call me like, this guy's $2,000 cheaper than you. I'm like, well, he's not doing it out of the kindness of his heart. There's something mm -hmm. there. It's rare that, that you'll get a price like that and something's not different. And, uh, you know, I, I, to this day, and my father's the same way. He had a customer call him and, and did the same thing. He was like, man, I'm really disappointed. This other company's cost was 30% cheaper than yours. And, you know, my dad, at his age, he's debt free. He's worked hard all his life. He's like, let him do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the guy a month later, his daughter's air conditioner went out. And he ended up referring my dad to her, not the company that ended up doing the work in his house. You know, the funny thing about this too, Nick, is I don't allow people to shop me. When somebody goes, well, hey, I'm interviewing agents. And I'm like, cool, I don't get interviewed. Here's the deal. I'm going to walk you through what my process is. Yep. And if that's a fit for you, great. And if not, don't bother calling me back because I'm not here to compete with anybody else because I am a master at what I do. Yes. And you know the quality of what you're going to get out of me. And as a matter of fact, even with a group of friends yesterday, we were talking about that customers leave. And there's two types of customers that leave. There's the customers that leave that you're like, thank God they left because yeah. they were paying ass to deal with anyways. And then the other ones that leave and then come back. Like you're, yeah. this example, right? And uh, even a good friend of mine, he's one of my investors. He's been a longtime client of Laura's long before I was even in the picture. And one time he deviated, yeah. and and I razz him to this day. Matter of fact, <laughs> I didn't think he would invest as much money as he did with me because I was I, I, I pointed out all the time. But he's a good guy, right? He's a good, he's a business owner, he, he, so he, he he gets it, right? Yeah. And 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 he was like, yeah, I I I, I, I mean that that lesson for him, I think, ended up costing him a hundred grand, Ooh. right? And 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 I like to remind him of it. And, uh, and so just cause he's good, you know, if I didn't love the guy, cause here's the thing is if I didn't like you, you just wouldn't hear from me. Right. Yeah. I'm just not going to talk to you. I'm not going to, you know, but that's what I want. It's like, look, it, come to me because you want the best come to yeah. me because you want the most trustworthy come to me because you're going to get the most sound advice. Yeah. But if you want me to jump hoops, to give you a dissertation of who I am and how I got to where I'm at, I can save you a lot of time. Just listen to my show here. Yeah. Right. And listen to the people that I bring on the show because that's who I surround myself with. So I'm not going to spend the time explaining it. You just, it's, it's really easy. I've got a choice and what I'm going to say to you, you got a choice on how you're going to receive and perceive it. And then you have a choice on whether or not you want to use me. And guess what? If you don't, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay yeah. with that. Yeah. Right. I, I like, look, I'm not here to be in the convincing business. One, I think, I think you and I proved it a long time ago. We don't, we don't have to prove any more of who we are and what right. we are, right? We we already did that, yeah. and we proved it beyond what most humans are willing to prove it. I don't need to be in that proving game anymore. You yeah. just get to choose. Is this the type you want? Am I the cheapest? Nope. Yeah. Do I cut my commission? Nope. Yeah. But will you get that most absolute 
sound, best quality service you can get? Yeah. Yep. Yep. 100%. As a matter of fact, we got kids at TCU moving into our properties, fighting. I mean, you've seen it. They're fighting to get into our properties, yeah. to live in our properties. Because guess what? Really, the only difference between my property and the other competition out there, none. Same square footage, same yeah. amount of bedrooms and everything else. So why are they paying me $1,000 more a month than them? Because yeah. of us. Because right. of what they get and the quality of service, right? Yeah. And, and it's like they want to. And when you have a client that's willing to, you know, I was like, hey, Nick, I don't care. Just tell me what it is. And how do I send it? As a matter of fact, you could make my life easier if you just had a button I could click and wire it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. I, and, and, I, and that's one thing I've noticed with people. And as I've gotten older, I've learned that, um, you know, it's, it's with auto mechanics, um, people in your industry, my industry, you know, plumbers, electricians, remodelers. Um, it's in all of it. You know, really, when you're dealing with people – with massive things that you're, you're doing in your life that what you'll find out is that the, the better person is probably not the cheapest on paper in that moment, but in the long run, they really kind of are. They save you a lot in the long run. If you have to, you have to look at where I'm going to be after all this is said and done after, you know, if you have to keep revisiting and I've had to do this with auto mechanics, man, they're just hard to find a good auto mechanic. I don't care about price. I just want a good job done. Yeah. I'm, I'm expecting to pay, a, a. I even hate to use the word premium. I just, I'm expecting to pay the appropriate rate to have a good job done. I'm and I don't have to worry it. about it anymore. I don't want to have to bring it back for the same problem. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's the thing that people don't understand is if you have to keep hopping around and finding somebody and you pay this guy to come and assess it and, and try this and that didn't work and he doesn't want to come back and then you call this person over here to look at it and well we need to do this as well and this is your cheapest bet and then it kind of helped but it didn't really solve the problem and for you know it if you would have just spent that up front to begin with you was going to spend it anyway you'd have saved yourself some grief mm-hmm. uh the you just you know in the air conditioning you'd have been comfortable from day one and you wouldn't be calling other people back. You wouldn't be frustrated uh, or embarrassed in some cases like these these customers. You know, it's, that's hard to do, to call somebody back and say, yeah, you was right. You know, help yeah. me out. Help me untangle this mess that I've created. And, um, you know, but again, just because somebody's the most expensive person doesn't mean that they're good neither. You know, it's reputation. Um, what I learned watching my father work his character, his heart on um, wanting to do the absolute best job. I don't know that it's necessarily a matter of being able to walk around and say, well, I'm better than everybody else at this. I think that's just a a possible byproduct of you truly giving your best effort every day. That could be a byproduct of it. But you see people, they get to where they, they don't care your customers, if they've used you before and they've had traumatic experiences, they don't question your cost. They just say, hey, I want a good job done. That's where I'm at on a lot of things is I'm not trying to be the most expensive guy. I just want to- You know the value. I just want to do what's what's fair for what you're going to get out of me is, you know, I don't get off these jobs at four in the afternoon like a lot of these bigger companies do. You know, um, you know, I'm there. I kind of go a little OCD about things. I watched my dad do it all these years and and I want to leave and you not have to call me back. And if you do, that's the number one priority. You know, you've already paid me. These other customers didn't. You feel the same way about what you offer. And, um, you know, you, you deal with some of these other companies and nowadays it's in every industry. You're going to pay a big premium. This company pulls you in and, and whatever the service may be. And then they have a disaster story. We show up behind it and it's like, wow, this is like uh, unreal what took place over here. Yeah. And even the people that look for the cheapest guy they can find on the block, every now and then they get lucky. They get a good product. They get a guy that's just starting out. He really does care. He's just trying to get some business. But those are hard to find. And then, you know, after they kind of build up their customer base, they know their value. They're going to come up to the market. And uh, but you but most people that hire based upon 
the cheapest person they can find. They don't care what what their character is. They don't care about their reputation. I'm just looking for the cheapest thing I can find today. I don't care about the details. They typically are hoping the end product is what my dad said this before. He said these people that will look for the cheapest guy they can when they don't have to, he said they're hoping to get what we do in someone's house for the cheapest price they can find. You know, and it just doesn't exist anywhere, Um, you know, but again, kind of going back to, like you said, dealing with people that know what they're going to get out of you, you know, they're not really investing in the home. They're kind of investing in you and your company because they know, hey, I'm going to them and they're going to help me with what, what I'm trying to achieve here. Same thing with air conditioning. I mean, you can buy... I like to deal with American standard products, train products. That's what I like to deal with. Um, but it's not really the air conditioner. You're kind of buying into me, my family, you know, um, and, and I don't advertise at all. You can go online. I've got a hundred and some odd Angie's List reviews. I don't pay them for any of them. Those are just people who have gone on and wrote about me and they're all A's. Uh, I don't have anything negative online, but but that's why my customers now – um, I've got customers that will just pitch a key under the thing. Now you say, well, you're bragging about your product. It's not that I feel good about that. You know, I, I enjoy getting up and feeling like I'm good at my job. I enjoy getting up and having customers say, Hey, there's a key under the mat. There's a check on the counter. If something changes, let me know. If not, I'll see you next year when it's time to do maintenance yeah. or something goes wrong. And, uh, man, that kind of stuff makes me feel proud. I think everybody likes it when they do a good job, you know, or people say something good about them. I love knocking on someone's door and them saying, so-and-so referred you to me and they just sung your praises. That I love more than anything, especially when my son's standing there. You know, I, I love that. I mean, that's what I'm after. I want to feel good about what I do. I desire to be the best. There's other great companies out there. It's just nowadays in all industries, you know, you just have to really be on your toes to look look for them. You got to sort through a lot of bad ones to find good ones, but they are out there. You know, we're not the only good outfit. I know some good outfits, um, but uh, you know, and I and and when I get backed up and I'm behind and it's one of my regulars because I want them taken care of, I'll refer them. I'll say, hey, call this guy right here. Okay, I trust him. Let me know what happens. He'll take care of you this time because I'm backed up and I want you taken care of. I don't want you waiting a week and a half, two weeks for me to get over there. Call this guy this one time. And I kind of like you said, kind of got that team mindset. You know, I've got their if, – if they refer one of their customers to me and that person turns around and calls me, you know, late, I'll ask them, did you call them first? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, they were backed up again and they told me to call you. And I usually coordinate with that that guy. Hey man, this customer called me again. Or you, yeah, man, please just if you can take care of them. I'm just I'm backed up. I've got a big project on my hands. You know, we we all work together and look out for each other, and it just somehow it works out, man. I mean, it just and like you said, dealing with you, it's nice to deal with a marine recon guy and Cas being here too. You know, who would have thought twenty years later we'd be doing business together in Fort Worth? And but it's it's nice because it's kind of got that team mindset like you were like hey man just go take care of it i know what i'm going to get out of this yeah you know because in a recon team unlike a lot of other units you typically once you make it into a team the whole thing is is hey look we're not here to babysit you you made it we're counting on you to just do your part and police yourself every day every day like we we don't we don't have to lay everything out and have an inspection on your rucksack before we go into the field it's like we're counting on you to be a professional and do your job. That's why you're here. And that's why we don't have to speak a whole lot, you know? So it's, it's nice to kind of work like that, especially this last week. It's just been nice to just be able to say, Hey, this property's completed and everybody giving a thumbs up because we kind of all know what to expect. And I know I'm going to be taken care of. That's why I was telling you before me. I'm not worried about tagging up with you right now. I just got to get these jobs done. I'm not concerned about it. Just let me stay focused, you know, and uh, let, let me do my part to take care of you. That's the most important thing because the rest of it always works out. But, you know, so it's what you've got going with, with your team, man. This is this is pretty neat. It's, that's rare. It's rare to see that. And 
And, uh, but yeah, I was telling my wife the other night, I'm like, man, it's just like being in a team again or something It just, everybody knows what to expect and everybody's mm-hmm. doing it and no one's trying to have feeling like they have to check in. It just, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to do that, uh, in work in that environment, but man, cause even with my customers, man, I got it. It's like, I got to keep an eye on them sometimes, you know? <laughs> I'm like, man, are you changing your filter, you know, or are you, yeah. uh, when I call, they call me and they tell me something's not running right, I'm like, turn it off, okay? And yeah. then I'll catch them. They'll think they're running it and shutting it off just before I get there. And I'll walk in. I'm like, you didn't shut it off, did you? You know, they're like, no, it's hot in here. <laughs> it just, you know, uh, yeah, you got to you gotta watch people. But in these small team type mindsets and what you've created, uh, it's neat to see that working out here on this side of things and not. Not in the military. It, I, it does exist out here. We 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 traded body bags for for greenbacks. Yeah, right? yeah, trying to, yeah. Right, trying to. So, well, let's go back to twenty year old self. And I know that we may not listen to older self, but if you could go back and you knew twenty year old self was going to listen to one nugget of it, nugget of advice of either do this or don't do this, what would you tell twenty year old self? You know, I I thought a little bit about that from time to time, and I uh, I feel like I'm a very blessed individual. Like it all worked out. You know, like I would want to be right where I am again. However, um, I would probably tell my 20 year old self uh, to capitalize on on more opportunity. You know, I've shied away from certain opportunities because I wasn't sure it was worth it or um maybe it was a, a lack of trust uh especially where business is concerned you know i've i've been a l- real hands on real involved uh, real untrusting um and i i would probably tell myself to you know lighten up a little bit with that like you know it, you know take a risk here and there more more so back when i was younger now I've kind of learned that in my later stages of my career. Um, but in the early stages, I probably could be a little further along had I done that. However, I'm perfectly happy right where I am, you know, but, but just capitalize on more opportunity, you know, in some opportunities I didn't realize was an opportunity at the time because I was just young. You know, I just kind of dismissed it like it'll be there later. Later comes sooner than later. <laughs> and you're like, dang, I wish I would have done that. <laughs> <laughs> Five, six, seven years ago, yeah. you know, I'm doing it now. If I would have done it then, I'd, you know, probably be doing it four times over now. And and that's the biggest thing I would say is just capitalize on opportunity when it shows up. Young people just let it slip by because they, you know, we got all the time in the world, right? And uh, that's that's probably the biggest thing. Uh, other than that, you know, uh, 20 year old self was, I've always just anything I was involved in, I just want to be the best I can be at it. Kind of like you. You know, it's just uh, I wouldn't trade my mentality or the way I'm wired for anything. I'm sure some people around me would trade it. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, but, I always say at our funeral, there's going to be a lot of people there. And it, half of them are going to miss us. And the other half are just there to make sure we're dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, I, I can envision some people standing up in mine saying, well, he wasn't always an asshole. <laughs> you know, but but uh, yeah, that's that's um. It's a it's a love hate thing with guys like us, you know. I and I, my mom and dad tell me it. My wife tells me it. My son even jokes about it. And you know, I got a buddy that Kaz and I both know very well. We was in force together with. He comes in a couple of times every year um, to uh, uh, to train and hunt with me and and everything else. And and you know, there's a reason why we all we all stick together, man. I mean, we just. You know, we, we desire to have that, that connection, uh, you know, our communication together is, we get it. You know, it's kind of like you and you and I, when we first met, it was like, we get it, you yeah. know, and, and we could sit here and talk about it for hours and hours. You know, your wife was having to drag you off the job <laughs> the other day and, and, you know, and really I needed to get back on the job and, and I just was like, you know, it's nice. Um, so I get a lot of customers that I want to show them the product. And they just, they're like, oh, man, you're killing me. I, I get it. I know you did. Yeah. I'm like, man, but I want you to see this and understand it, you yeah. know, and, uh, you know, but it's just the way we're wired. I wouldn't trade that because I've been 20 year old self was that way. Just capitalizing on more opportunity. I think 
you know, not, not letting time slip. I've always thought, oh, that'll be there later. Let me focus on this right now. And that's not always the case. Sometimes that opportunity comes back and you think, why didn't I do this five years ago? And then sometimes it doesn't come back at all. So we're, we're, how, how, how do people get in touch with you? Where do they go? Website, email, phone number, which, what do you got? Uh, you can call me, email me, um, uh, message me. I am on social media. I have a Facebook page. It's Texas Air Pro, not Air Pros with an S. Um, uh, it's just Texas Air Pro. There's a company out there that um, kind of copied it a little bit and they put an S on the end of it. And I don't even know that you can get in touch with them. Uh, but we're Texas Air Pro. Uh, you can email me at contact at texasairpro.com, uh, you know, or call the company line, 817-822-0274. Um, you know, and you can Google us. I don't pay Google to advertise, but you can find us on there. And, uh, you know, that's the best way to get in touch with me. And I always say I, I'm a hands-on guy. I do the work, as you know. So if you call and get a voicemail, don't don't panic. Just leave me a voicemail or even shoot me a text. I will call you back. I'm probably talking to a customer uh, or I've got my hands off in some electrical or something like that. And it's just not a good time to answer the phone, but I will call back, um, you know, so that's probably the the best way to get in touch with me. Um, you know, just don't come knock on my door at 10 o'clock. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't recommend that for anybody. I'll tell you a funny cat story. So just in case you're driving down the road and you were listening to this episode, you weren't watching on YouTube, you can always go to our website, myexperiencedrealtor.com, experience with an ED, hit the podcast button, scroll down to Nick Wright. You will have all the links and everything else for it to make it easier for you to get in touch with them. Download this episode and other episodes on all the different platforms and always... If you're looking to buy, sell real estate anywhere on the planet, go ahead and tune in to the homepage. Click trust, find a trusted professional. We'll make sure you get somebody good. Nick, thanks for coming on the thanks, show. Thanks, man.